from 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7 this morning. As we think about the topic, get on your knees and fight like a man. The importance of prayer in the life of a man of God. Before we do that, I've received a note uh, from our very own Clifton Scroggins who said, I'm able to watch uh, going to church with you this morning. And he said, pray for me. It's the second uh, Father's Day that I've been away from my family. Of course, his, his military responsibilities have taken him away now. And it occurred to me that there are many people like that today who are training, standing in the gap for freedom, and who cannot be with their families. And particularly, I think about those men in the military who would be joining their families in worship today if they were available to do so. And I want to pray for them right now. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name, and we thank you again for faithful men who strive under God, according to the word, with the help of the Spirit in the name of Christ, to lead their families well. We think particularly today about those in the military, scattered, whether they're scattered across this country, away from their families, or whether they're scattered across the world, that you will bless them, that you will miraculously, in a way that only you can, knit their hearts and the hearts of their, their wives, their children, to them today. And assure them that we love them and we thank you for them because they are willing to sacrifice so much so that we can do what we do uh, in this place in freedom, unmolested. So bless them this day, this Father's Day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7. I hope you found that in your Bibles. We have it on the screen if you're not you don't have access to the scripture. Stand with me if you would as I read these seven verses that say so much. And then we're going to remain standing and I want us to read in unison together the Apostles' Creed that we just sang. Peter is teaching about how Christians are to operate in a society that recognizes authority. Likewise, wives. Be subject to your own husband, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. But this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And now I want us to read together the Apostles' Creed. We just sang it. Let's read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. This is not an exposition on the Apostles' Creed, but I will tell you I believe the phrase, he descended into hell, speaks of his, of his taking hell upon himself as he hung on the cross, and he drained hell of its power for all who would believe. And the Holy Catholic Church there is in, is in little letters. Catholic there meaning universal, not, not the apostate people 
who call themselves the Holy Roman Catholic Church, who've erroneously assigned a pope to lead them. Those little correctives, those little explanations on the Apostles' Creed. These are strange times. Strange times. Karen and I were married 44 years on Friday. On the Sunday after we were married, that's, amen. A clap for her, clap for Karen. It is amazing that Karen would put up with something like that for 44 years. She's an incredibly patient woman. We were talking about that being in Dallas, how we drove through Dallas on, on that Sunday and we're on our way to New Mexico and then to Colorado for our honeymoon. And uh, 44 years ago though, if someone would have told me as I was, my first day as a husband, in fact, I was so giddy about it. We were going through Dallas, and they announced on the radio, we were in a little Ford Pinto, had no air conditioning, could catch on fire at any moment, if you remember those, those cars. And they announced on the radio that at Lion Country Safari today, husbands and fathers get in free. So we detoured. We got off the interstate, which was always dangerous in Dallas. You could just totally lose your way. No GPS, just big maps. And we found Lion Country Safari. We went through it with windows rolled up, almost suffocated uh, in, in the heat in June because I was a husband. I could do that. There were perks getting in line country safari free. Never would I have thought that we would live in a day when you could go into a target and depending on how you identify sexually that day, you could choose your restroom. Never did I think that evangelicalism would be under assault itself. When the society, unless the Lord comes, society is wasted. When, when states like California and others are allowing on, the li on their driver's license, not male or female, but Z or some nonsensical substitute. When parents are giving blockers to children and they refuse to identify their sex when they're born. Babylon B, the, the spoof, you, if you're familiar with that on Facebook, they spoof everything, said parents were having a, 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 a sex identity, a reveal party for their teenager. Uh, it's absurd in every way. Never did it cross our minds. That would be a possibility, and yet this is where we live. The Me Too movement has exposed Hollywood and Washington, D.C., and the State House, and professional athletes, and sadly, even the church, of abuse of women, awful abuse of women. At the recent SBC, there were several resolutions passed to say with clarity that we abhor and stand against the abuse of women, uh, and yet it's occurring. It's occurring all across the spectrum. We've lost our way. How? How? Well, at least partially, this whole identity crisis that we're experiencing across the culture can be traced back to the failure of men to embrace our God-given roles as leaders, nurturers, and protectors of women and children in God's order for a society that receives his blessing. I don't think you lay it all at the feet of men. I've said before, you lay a lot of this stuff at the pulpit. It's not been declared clearly, not been spoken to directly, not clinging to the scripture as our only authority, as, as sufficient for life and godliness. We've abandoned that. We've lost that in the culture. And I'll, when I share my report with you, uh, coming up one Sunday evening, I'll tell you how it's affecting even the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, though there's commitment to fight back against it. I believe that if men would be men, have done with lesser things, we would be raising a generation after generation that embraces the truth as it is in Jesus, that there would be no place for a gender identity crisis, no place for supposedly men going around saying that there ought to be women preaching in the pulpits, no place. 
be no place for the ongoing nonsense of accusing people that just because they're white, they're racist. There are white racists, but not just because you're white. That's a, that's a sin problem in the heart. It's got nothing to do with, with skin pigmentation. And yet this is where we live. So what are we going to do? Well, we can fuss about it. So what? Or we can do what the scripture calls upon us to do. And I think it's in this passage and many other passages that men are at their best when we fight. We fight for the faith. We fight for our wives. We fight for our children. We fight for our families. We fight for our church. We fight for society on our knees. I want you to see in this passage briefly today two things. Now, if you've been around me any time at all, we've ever, ever talked about marital challenges or even just reflected on it, this is the go-to passage. <laughs> there are others, we'll cite them, but this is it. So what I want to see from this passage today. First of all, in verses 1 to 6, the life no wife should ever have to live. The life no wife should ever have to live. And secondly, verse 7, the life every husband should embrace. So verse 1 to 6, the wife should ever have to, particularly if the wife is, a, is the wife of a, of a Christian man. Peter says, likewise, and in the same manner, in the same way, wives, be subject. That word we told you before, it's a, it comes out of the military term, is to place yourself under the authority of someone who, is, who has been placed rightfully in authority over you. Be subject to your own husband, so that even if some do not obey the word. Now, guys, we are at our best sinners saved by grace. So we're going to be struggling in areas. It's just a part of the reminder that this is why we don't call this place heaven, because it's not heaven yet. We're undergoing sanctification, growing in grace, but we're not in heaven yet. We haven't experienced glorification. So, so this is not a call to perfection. In fact, it's a spectrum here. This could be saying to a woman in the culture that Peter is addressing that, that you and your husband were both pagans at one time, and the Lord has saved you by his grace through faith, and you find yourself married to a man who is not a believer. It could be talking to a woman who, who is living with a husband who doesn't even, begin, doesn't even have eyes to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. I do not obey the word. Because the word obey there is also, it's, it's, it can be translated who do not believe the word. And truth of the matter, it does, let's just cut to the chase here. A, a practicing disobedience to aspects of the word is a functional disbelief of that. It can be that, but it can be anywhere along that spectrum that a man who, who is, uh, would otherwise be a man who would love his wife, love his children, love the Lord Jesus, is struggling in pockets or areas where he is being disobedient. He is, he is not reflecting. In fact, I'm going to say something. Brothers and sisters, any time we engage habitually in disobedience to any aspect of the word, we are functional. We're not the, but we are functional antichrists. It's an antichrist attitude. Don't care what Christ says, I'm going to do this. Don't care what Christ says, I'm not going to do that. So get the, get the grip on how seriously Scripture teaches, and you're going to see the seriousness of it in this text here. But it's a, it's a life that no wife should ever have to live. The Scripture says, okay, here's your challenge, women. You don't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Well, that's in Genesis, remember? Part of the fall was your desire will be contrary to your husband. You'll challenge him. But the challenge for the woman, and, I, and bless her heart, I have repented on my face when I put my wife in this situation in years past. When I put her in a position where she has to get alone and weep before God and say, God, please, wake my husband up to this. 
And bless God. And some of you know, some of you here have been married 50 something years. How many more than 50? Raise your hand, more than 50 years. You're the experts. God bless you for hanging in there that long. You encourage us to keep going. My wife, my wife looks at me and I said, remember though, so and so and so, they've been married more than 50 years. <laughs> we can do this. And she knuckles up for another try. It's a challenging thing. Win them without a word by the conduct of their wives. The goal is, and this is not, this is not a sermon directed to women. I want, I want to read this here. The respectful and, and pure conduct, a conduct that can only be explained in terms of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he says, do not let your adorning be external, we've talked, we went through 1 Peter, so I'm not going to preach this letter again to you. But you know, he's, not, he's saying they're not merely, he's not advocating homeliness and ugliness in the name of godliness. That's not what this is about. It's about, you don't put the emphasis there. This passage and others from Paul, I've challenged young women through the years to say, look, here's my challenge. You commit to spend as much time working on your heart as you spend working on your makeup and your clothing, and you will be something that can conquer areas of this society. He goes and talks about it, and he says it's very precious. When the Lord says something very precious, we need to perk up to that. And he talks about how holy women of old fought this battle. Sarah, and I've told you this before, whose who's husband passed her off twice as his sister because he was a coward. And yet she trusted the Lord. Well, that's no wife. Let me say this, men. If your wife is living something like that right now, then you need today, before the sun goes down, get alone before God and repent on your face to him and beg him to forgive you and then get up Put your big boy panties on and go face your wife and repent to her. And if you have children, guess what? <laughs> They're watching. They know. They know. Kids are pretty perceptive. You know, I saw a church sign one time that said, out of the mouths of babes come things we should never have said in the first place. They pick it up. They pick it up. And so that's a life that no wife should ever have to live. But here's, here's Scripture is so plain. Husbands are to treat their wives as follows. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Someone said, well, I can't do that. Well, you sure better try. Because I promise you, standing before God in judgment, you say, you know that Ephesians 5, 25 thing? <laughs> no, nah. better try. Well, come up short. That's good. That's okay. All of us come up short, but you better try. One preacher said years ago, he said, you better chase out after holiness. That's the word in Hebrews, pursue holiness. It's the word pursue is per persecute to try to lay hold of it. He said, you better chase out after holiness. You may not catch it, but you sure better chase it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with her. That word harsh there means do not Treat her in such a way that she becomes bitter. Now, there are not many places in the Scripture where, where the attitude of someone is placed squarely on someone else. This is one of them. Your wife getting bitter? Well, I just have a bitter wife. Go look in the mirror. The Scripture says there's a reason why. There's a reason why. Do not. Be harsh with her. Do not embitter her. Well, fathers and their children. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. This, it's the word, it's the Greek word that means it's wrath. It's to, to burn. Do not provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, in the, in, in the teaching and the counseling. There's the second word used there is the word for counsel. It's the word to, to hear them to listen to them and give them godly counsel. You can't listen to them unless you spend time with them. There's a lot of things calling for men these days. Doesn't matter if it's the workaholic, the busy, busy guy, 
the video game guy, doesn't matter. But I'm telling you something, be, be careful how you spend your time. Because you cannot do those things all the time and do this here. Raise them in the instruction and the counsel of the Lord. And then Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Scripture is very clear here. So there's a life that no wife, and I would add this, no child should ever have to live. And yet you and I know that multitudes of them live that. But brothers, just because multitudes are experiencing that tragically, it doesn't mean that yours should. God's going to come into the garden of your life one day. Just as he came into the garden where Eve had sinned against God and Adam went along with her, God came in and said, Adam, where are you? You're responsible here. Go bring things. Second thing I want to see here is the life every husband should embrace. Likewise, so in the same manner, same, same context of recognizing that God has order to his society, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And here it is, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We read a passage from James that said, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. There's a flip side to that coin though. The prayers of a man who is not consciously, conscientiously, intentionally, continually engaging in this one brief expression is a man whose prayers are brassed over. They barely get out of this mouth. They certainly don't hit the ceiling, and they never get past the ceiling. Scripture says that. And yet if the way to fight, pray without ceasing, pray continually. If that's the way we win, it'll never happen. Likewise, husbands. Live with. The word there is dwell together. It's got that preposition on it that means together. Dwell together. That doesn't, that's way more than under the same roof. Way more than in the same bed. It's live with them, and the, and the key is in an understanding way. When, I, when we went through First Peter, I told you that that's a, if you want a Bill Askell paraphrase of that, that's, that's husbands continually be getting to, know, getting to know your wife. She changes. 44 years in, and you guys know this that are down the road, your wife's itches move around. If you're not checking to see where she's itching, you may be scratching her, and that's not helping, that's just annoying her. You better be sure you're scratching where she's itching. And they change. About every five, six, seven years, we all go through life cycle changes. I've told you this before. I remember one time, years ago, I was saying to Karen, I said, Karen, I wish, why don't you ever fix any fried okra? She said, you don't like okra? I said, I would like some fried okra. I said, when did that start? And she was right. As I thought about it, I, you couldn't force feed me okra. But through some life cycle change, something happened. I suddenly had a desire for something I'd never liked and had never tasted. And, and, and thankfully, it's something that's continued. To this day, I like fried okra. But it's, we change, folks. With an understanding way, understand her, which is a challenge. You've heard the story of the guy that found a genie bottle, rubbed it, and a genie popped out and said, what do you want? He said, well, I hate flying. I'd like to go to Hawaii. I'd like a highway built from California to Hawaii so I can drive over. Genie said, you realize how much concrete that would take to do that? You can't do that. And he said, okay, what else would you want? He said, I would like to understand the ways of a woman. The genie said, you want that two lanes or four lanes? It's challenging understanding women. It is. They're they're complex. We're not. They are complex. And you do that showing honor. You don't don't get to understand a woman, know a woman, by mistreating her, by speaking down to her. One of the worst series of movies they ever put out was Tarzan movies. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane. That's stupid. The monkey in that movie was smarter than Tarzan. And it harmed relationships. Show honor. Honor her. The best men I know honor their wives. And you honor her because of these things. She's a weaker vessel. 
God has put women together in a way. Weaker doesn't mean inferior, but weaker means that she faces challenges and infirmities. Her psyche, her physical development is totally different from yours, guys. And if you exploit that weakness, God, have mercy on you. We're supposed to throw a blanket over that and cover her and never expose her and never exploit her and stand and defend her and keep anybody from doing that, even her family. You cherish her. You protect her. She's weaker, but I promise you, you and I, even if we could, would never try to have a baby. It's just it's incredible that she can do that. And yet God has built her in a way that she can, and along with that comes challenges, physiological, biological, temperamentally, emotional, mental, that we need to protect. And also because she's a joint heir. See, this notion of, of, uh, of husband being in charge, wife submitting, doesn't speak of inferiority. She's a joint heir of the grace of life. And I promise you, heaven is looking on. And when some man in the name of being my man of the house, when some man treats his wife in an inferior way, heaven looks at that and the angels go, wait a minute, you tell me both those people have been saved by the same grace? It's an assault upon heaven. Joint heirs of the grace, this life-giving grace. And then here it is. So that, here's the purpose. Certainly to glorify God, certainly to bless the woman God's given you. Here's the purpose, though. Your prayers may not be hindered. I've told you before, many times my father verbally could pray some of the most eloquent prayers you ever heard a man pray. And people would tell me how much they were blessed by them in church. But I promise you, I lived with him. His prayers barely made it out of his mouth. It certainly never hit the ceiling. Didn't get out of the auditorium and did not reach heaven. It was a mockery. And I'm just appealing today. I don't, want, I don't want you men to make a mockery of Christianity. I don't, want you, I don't want to do that. I don't want you men to send a strange message. That I, oh, how I love Jesus, but oh, how I love to take it out on my wife. There's something wrong with that. I learned early on in marriage when Karen's parents weren't really sure about her marrying me. And who could blame them? They knew my dad. I learned early on that the way you win the in-laws is they habitually, continually see their daughter smiling, delighted, happy, fulfilled. And I won them by God's grace. I won them. And we can too. All of us can. Now I want to read something to you. It's going to take a few minutes. And I know it's so bear with me, though. I came across this article. And I, I put it on Facebook, it's written by Owen Strachan, who's, uh, who's a professor at Midwestern Seminary. This explains what's going on in our culture as well as anything I have heard or read. Let me read it to you. I can steer, still hear third day soaring rendition of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and maker of earth. The lead singer's baritone sent this millennial old confession, the first line of the creed up to the rafters and beyond, rendering that elegant historic statement an anthem of praise. Christians have sung and exulted in this creed for centuries. Martyrs have recited it as they walk to their deaths. Humble believers across the globe have cherished these biblical truths in their workaday lives. Countless churches have incorporated the creed into weekly worship, connecting their local assembly to thousands of others. But all this must now give way in America. A great movement to transform the West is afoot, one that is sweeping away distinctions between the sexes and authoritatively dynamiting any vestige of authority and hierarchy, these being tools of oppression, we're told to believe. This does not only relate to quotidian matters, the public restrooms we use, for example, even that which is sacred is not sacred. God himself must be altered and edited to fit our cultural revolution. Instead of confessing their belief in God the Father Almighty, Minnesota Methodist, will now apparently speak of their faith in a degendered God the Creator Almighty. According to the Christian Post, they've edited language spelling out the father-son relationship. No longer will they speak of Jesus Christ, his only son, but rather the gender-neutral Jesus Christ, God's only son. Please 
to edit the identity of God the Father is to deny who he is. To deny who God is means that you blaspheme God. You do not submit to his rev revelation. You do not honor his word. How tragic this is. We see in instances like this that there is a terrible momentum in our time. Paganism is on the march. This is, in truth, not a new struggle. In his 1898 Stone Lectures at Princeton University, Abraham Kuyper said as much, do not forget that the fundamental contrast has always been, is still, and will be until the end, Christianity and paganism, the idols or the living God. God originally makes a world brimming with beauty and diversity, with the eternal Godhead grounding all things ontologically, metaphysically, epistemologically. The serpent in his anti-wisdom, listen to this, seek to tear this order apart, making everything the same and deny the vibrant glory of the God-made world. This is the conflict of the ages, God versus Satan, beauty versus drudgery, pagan androgyny versus biblical manhood and womanhood. Our secular culture is putting tremendous pressure on us to rework all of our thinking. This includes every facet of our theology, up to and including our theology proper, our doctrine of God himself. Again, please understand, nothing, truly nothing, is sacred today. This is a major part of what the serpent seeks to do. He wants to take what God has enchanted, mankind as his image, and deface it, denude it, erase the artistry of divine design. Satan wants a genderless, androgynous, fear, featureless, diversityless world. Satan hates the man and he hates the woman. He always has, he always will. Satan hates the father. He hates the father's plan of salvation. He hates the father's headship. He hates those who in a particular way get to image the father's glory, earthly fathers and especially Christian fathers who worship the father consciously. This is an important word as we celebrate Father's Day. It matters not really whether you buy a Hallmark card on a specific day, though I recommend this, he says. The key question is this, do you love the biblical vision of fatherhood? Do you love the vision of manhood behind biblical fatherhood? Do you see men and women as uniquely imaging the glory of God through fidelity to God in their God-given roles? The first revelational truth we learn about humanity is that man and woman image God, being made in his likeness. The man and the woman thus possess absolute equality and infinite dignity. But you cannot in any way stop here, for the Bible does not. The second truth we learn is that man and the that the man and the woman, though of the same kind, are not given the same roles. The man is made first. His, he names his wife. He has the leadership role in the home, being called to leave his family and take a wife and hold fast to her. The woman is the man's helper, his azir, and as such follows and honors and joyfully receives his leadership. The New Testament only heightens and expands this glorious teaching. The marriage relationship is a picture of the Christ-Church relationship. The call of men to teach and exercise authority in the local church is predicated upon divine order in the home. Women in the church do not occupy the teaching and shepherding and authority exercising office. They serve and bless the church in many ways and are shown tremendous grace by the Lord of the church and his ministry. They're called to disciple one another, a discipleship which zeroes in on child raising and homemaking. In the churches in the home, they're called to submit and support their godly leaders. These fundamental truths lay out the different callings of men and women in the God-ordered world. Christians do not raise their boys and girls as the world does, as if there are no meaningful distinctions between the sexes. Christian women model for their daughters a gentle, quiet spirit. Christian men train their sons in the very mold of Christ himself. They raise their boys to protect, lead, and provide for women. All this represents an absolute inversion of worldly wisdom and pagan teaching. The pagans, we know, encourage women to sexualize themselves robbed women of their rights, trained men to prize effeminacy, homosexual decadence, and chauvinism. Christ and his church taught a worldview in which God ordered the world, gave, God gave men and women valuable callings, God called the sexes out of sexual wickedness, and God made people of every group and tribe one new man in Jesus Christ. The gospel did not demolish all differences or even all authority structures. It fundamentally transformed them. A man who was called to be the head of his wife, for example, but not in a pagan way. He was a uniquely Christ-like head, called to lay down his life for his wife, just as Christ sacrificed himself to purchase his bride, the church. The gospel thus supercharges creational distinctiveness with the awesome power of divine grace. Once in Adam, men abused and preyed upon women. Once in Adam, women fought and, dis and disdained men. Now in Christ... Men honor women in their role. Women honor men in their role, in the home and the church, and wherever possible in society. This is complementarity. In this biblical vision, this worldview of ordered love, fathers fill an essential role. This is not the case increasingly in America, in the West, however. 
Divorce has ravaged the American home. Young men far more volatile in general terms than young women. They on average have a thousand percent more testosterone than girls. Rage in response. They're 97 percent of public shooters. They commit nine out of the ten most violent crimes. All too often they prey upon women, do not marry the mothers of their children, do not hold stable jobs, end up a destructive force. Other men, thankfully most, do not embrace a life of crime. Raised either without a father or with an indifferent one, they remain in a state of perpetual boyhood. They have no idea what it means to be a man, a father, a provider, a protector, a Christ-like head. This is true even among evangelicals in evangelical homes. Some pastors sadly shy away from biblical exposition of text on the sexes. As a result, many professing Christians have little idea of the numerous teachings that unfold biblical faithfulness for men and women. And he has a section on, on singleness. Even outside of marriage, single men should model biblical manhood. Single women should take joy in biblical womanhood. But the churches, some churches do not even touch on these matters. And so in some congregations, single Christian men and women are as confused as non-Christians. In an increasingly pagan, secular, order denying doxology compromising context, what on earth should the church do? The church should celebrate the God-made order. The church should glory in biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. The church should connect the gospel to the unique calling of men and women. The church should honor and train up fathers and mothers, providers and homemakers. The church should encourage boys and girls to dress in different ways and love the distinct form and frame God has given them. The church should preach the grace of repentance for all sinners and teach that once we, were, once we are converted, we are a new creation and have decisively broken with our sinful identity and practice. The church should guide single men and women through the chaos of our divorce-ravaged, maturity-delaying, sex-focused culture. The church in some should not shy away from these things. The church should teach and teach and teach some more, all with joy, all with a sense of exalting in God and his good design. The church should recommit itself, the elders giving leadership here, in helping the people of God fighting many battles, facing many trials to fight for holiness. We're not victims, as our culture tells us. In the spirit, we are more than conquerors. All this leads us to one last matter. God the Father loves fathers. He delights in fathers who love their children, for he is good to his chosen. He rejoices when a man leaves father and mother, rejecting a sinful and pagan sexual ethic, takes one wife. He's richly glorified when a man, usually an anonymous man, searches out the scriptures and devotes himself to the biblical priorities of husband and father. Whether anyone else sees it or not, the father loves it when earthly fathers image his goodness and grace, provide for their family, lead their family spiritually, protect their wife and children. Father's Day reminds us just as little of the just Father's Day reminds us just a little of the Father's delight in covenant leaders of the home. The culture is not trending this way. The culture is driven by an energy that seeks to destroy what God has ordered. Even religious groups are following this anti-wisdom. They're playing down God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. They are even revising the very doctrine of God Himself. A terrible momentum swirls all around us, urging us to deny the very dignity of the Father to embrace androgyny in thought and practice, to detest authority and hierarchy, to see roles given to the sexes as chains placed on us by an unkind deity. The church must spot the lie. The church must preach and teach the truth. The church must celebrate God-made order. We do not all have the voice of Mac Powell of Third Day, but we can all confess and love what the church has said for millennia, defying a fallen world and a pagan culture and in so doing, say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We, the true church, will never give up biblical complementarity. We shall never give up this confession. We shall recite it and sing it and love it until the Father brings us to our eternal rest. Men, lead your families. Get on your knees. Fight like a man. Pray with your wife. Pray over your wife. Pray over your children. And make sure that your prayer to God for them and with them is not neutered by your conduct and your words when you're not on your knees. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We, we thank you for your order 
We recognize we live in a day that would love to do everything it can to destroy your order, and yet we cling to it. And as men, we don't cling to it because it gives us authority. We cling to it because we tremble for the day when we stand before the living God and give an answer, give an answer for our own lives, give an answer for how we cared for and loved our wife, give an answer for how we loved and cared for our children. Oh, God, move here, now. Revive us, Lord. Revive us in these years. And raise up from this place a church that makes a difference, first in the home, then in the culture. And God, protect us and deliver us from letting the culture shape our homes and our values. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.